I want to thank the IHES for uh, its very kind uh, invitation to give these lectures. And uh, I will be talking about uh, general relativity, uh, concentrating on problems which are connected with uh, black holes. So I apologize, maybe uh, at the beginning I will, I'll start with an introduction. So for people who are already very familiar with the sub subject of general relativity, it might be a bit boring, but uh, uh, I hope to get something of interest to everybody. So this is the introduction. Um, so uh, let me talk a, a little bit about uh, general relativity. So this is uh, a physical theory which is, uh, uh, has a very strong mathematical background in the sense everybody knows, of course, that, that uh, Riemannian geometry, uh, the notion of curvature played a fundamental role. Uh, and uh, what's remarkable about, uh, about uh, general relativity is that just about any concept which has physical meaning can also be immediately translated into something which is uh, purely geometric. Right? So, for example, uh, you know, you have Lorentzian, Lorentzian uh, metrics, Lorentzian geometry is at the heart of general relativity. So, uh, well, that means you have manifolds. Maybe I should, I should take some chalks and, and also put something on the blackboard. Uh, is there a chalk somewhere? Yeah. Below. 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 Oh, here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Obviously, uh, the starting point uh, of Lorentzian geometry and therefore general relativity, uh, the fundamental object is that of a manifold with a, with a metric. And of course, the only difference is that, uh, so the manifold is the same definition as uh, in the Manian geometry. Uh, the only difference is that uh, the metric of interest is not a Riemannian metric, but rather Lorentzian. So it has signature minus plus plus. You can also have higher dimensions if you want. I'll put here 1 plus n. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, phys physical concepts like inertia translates into just the fact that the tangent space at every point on the manifold is a Minkowski space. Uh, events, so physical events, are nothing else than points in the manifold. Observers are what are, are called time-like curves. So that means, uh, well, first of all, I should say at every point in the tangent space, you have a light cone uh, where the metric degenerates and uh, you can immediately distinguish between time-like directions, space-like directions, and null directions, right? So, so this, uh, the, the division is simply based on looking at, at vectors at the point where uh, this, the metric will be negative, zero, or positive. So this is space-like, this is null, and this is, uh, is uh, time-like. So, uh, uh, so therefore, you have a notion, you have, you have this uh, notion of time-like curves, which simply means it's a curve on a manifold such that at every point, the tangent space to the curve is uh, time-like. Okay? So time-like in the sense that it verifies uh, this. All right, so and this corresponds to observers. So observers in general activity are nothing else but uh, uh, time-like curves from a mathematical point of view. So again, is this remarkable, dichot this, this remarkable uh, translation between things which are purely geometric and things which are physical. Light rays, so this, this is where light is supposed to propagate, uh, are nothing else but uh, null geodesics. Right? So a geodesic, again, the, the concept of a geodesic is exactly the same as in Riemannian geometry. And null simply means a geodesic, which is such that uh, the tangent at every point is, uh, gives you uh, g uh, xx is equal to 0, where x is a, is a tangent to that point. Proper time, which is nothing else. So the proper time uh, uh, along a curve is nothing, uh, nothing else than the affine parameter just like in Riemannian geometry. Uh, tidal forces, in, which have a, a clear physical meaning, are nothing else but curvature, right? So again, the curvature meaning exactly the same, it has the same meaning as in Riemannian geometry. Given the metric G, you can associate uh, the so-called uh, Riemann curvature tensor, so Rijkl, let's say, 
Uh, and the definition, the formal definition in Lorentzian geometry is exactly the same. There is no difference, right? So you have, uh, you have uh, uh, tidal forces. You have then isolated systems. Again, a, con a physical concept, which means that you imagine, you imagine uh, that something interesting happens at the local point in space and time, say a galaxy or, or just a star. And uh, then the uh, isolated means that somehow the remaining part of the manifold is really, uh, is really just flat space. So somehow things, uh, you, you focus on the part where something interesting happens and everywhere else uh, things become, become uh, uh, flat. In other words, uh, there is no, no additional uh, physical input into the system. So these are called isolated physical systems. So again, it's nothing else but asymptotic flatness. Asymptotic flatness, the definition, the formal mathematical definition, is just again, you are on a manifold, and uh, typically the manifolds <coughs> of interest, when, in particular if you talk about uh, isolated system, is the ones which uh, are, uh, are uh, say, diffeomorphic, at least outside a sufficiently compact space. They look like R1 plus N from a topological point of view. And uh, you want the metric also to look Minkowskian uh, if you are sufficiently far away from, from uh, an, this isolated system. All right, so that's, uh, so as you see, everything translates. I mean, this is a remarkable thing about general relativity is that everything interesting from a physical point of view has a very simple geometric meaning. Uh, equivalence principle, uh, which is uh, at the heart of general relativity, from a, from a mathematical point of view, it's translated simply in saying that all physical laws can be expressed only in terms of the metric and its indu induced connection, right? So if I, if I, if I have the a metric G, so again, in Lorentzian geometry, it's exactly like in Riemannian geometry, you can associate a connection, which is the so-called Levi-Civita connection. So exactly the same properties as in Riemannian geometry. All right, so... Uh, more concepts of interest in Lorentzian geometry, which come all the time. So first of all, time orientation uh, simply means that I have a, a manifold, which is Lorentzian, and uh, uh, orientation is given by a vector field, say maybe I'll, I'll call it T, a vector field uh, which is globally defined on the manifold and it's time like at every point. So that's, uh, that gives you a time orientation, which allows you to separate between things which, which moved forward in time and backward in time. Uh, uh, curves which are time-like or causal, I already said what time-like means. Uh, so time-like simply means that you have a curve where the tangent is uh, time-like at every point. Causal would mean that you allow the tangent also to be null, okay? So, uh, future and past sets, well, let me, let me go here, let me move here. F future and past sets, again, a very simple concept, but it's quite important in, uh, in Lorentzian geometry and, of course, in general relativity, is that uh, uh, if you have a set, a set S on, on your manifold, you are interested in all points, so the future set of S, uh, is a set of all points which be can be connected to S by a time-like curve, right? And causal set will, will mean that uh, you also allow the curve to be causal, right? So, for example, if you have an Alcon in Minkowski space, uh, then uh, the future of this point, the, the, the time, so you distinguish between time-like future and causal future. The time-like future will be all the points inside the light cone, the causal will also allow the points on the boundary, right? All right, so uh, future and past sets, hypersurfaces. So this is another uh, thing that, of course, you discuss in Riemannian geometry, you can discuss in Lorentzian geometry. The difference is only that now you have three types of hypersurfaces of interest. The ones which are space-like. So space-like, the space-like hypersurface is such that if you look at the, the unit normal, at every point, it's time-like, right? So unit normal is time-like at every point, which means that if I look at the Lorentzian metric and I restrict it to the space-like hypersurface, I get a Riemannian metric, right? So, so that's uh, uh, Riemannian geometry, 
as a consequence, is part of Lorentzian geometry, right? And part of Riemannian, uh, part of uh, general relativity. You really have to know Riemannian geometry very well in order to succeed uh, doing anything of interest in in uh, Lorentzian geometry. I mean, in general relativity. All right. So uh, so we have uh, hypersurfaces which are space-like, hypersurfaces which are null. So this is a null hypersurface, right? So it's it's uh, as you see the uh, it's ruled by uh, geodesics which are null or curves which are null, let's say. Uh, and uh, finally, you can have something time-like. Time-like will simply mean that, for example, if I take a section like this uh, in, in Minkowski space, this would be a time-like section, right? So uh, in that case, <coughs> the metric induced is still Lorentzian. So you have the original Lorentzian metric. It induces a Lorentzian metric on a time-like surface. Another uh, concept of, of importance which uh, shows up a lot is that of a Cauchy hypersurface. So this is a space-like hypersurface with a property that if you take any point in the manifold, so you say that the manifold has a Cauchy hypersurface or that this is a Cauchy hypersurface in a manifold. If you take any point on the manifold, you can, uh, and you look at uh, you look at uh, any time-like curve, it will have to intersect the uh, Cauchy hypersurface in, uh, always it has to intersect the Cauchy hypersurface and intersect it just exactly at one point, right? So obviously, uh, T equal constant in Minkowski space is a Cauchy hypersurface because obviously every curve which is time-like will have to intersect this. But if I look at, if I look at this hypersurface, which is space-like, it is still space like it's not a Cauchy hypersurface because obviously I have all these time like curves here which do not intersect the hypersurface. Right? So, anyway, it's a very important concept. And uh, we'll talk more about this. All right, so the, the, the next topic uh, do I have an eraser somewhere? Also, the same thing. I have to find it here, I guess, but it's not. On this side. Okay, good. All right. All right, so, uh, all right, so uh, frames. So in Riemannian geometry, of course, uh, the, the kind of frames that you see always in Riemannian geometry, so if I have a manifold with a Riemannian metric, typically a frame is uh, a set of vector fields, say U1, EN, on, on G, such that uh, the metric G, E, I, E, J is equal to delta I, J, right? So for all I and J, and this is a Kronecker uh, symbol. Uh, in Lorentzian geometry, of course, you can define the same thing. So you can have, so you can have frames which are called orthonormal, right? So for example, if you are in Minkowski space, you can take, you can take a, a direction in the, the a time direction, a time direction, uh, say, is zero, and uh, then E1, EN minus one, or EN, let's say, if I am in N plus one dimensions, will uh, be space-like curves, uh, space-like uh, vector fields, which are perpendicular to E zero, and E zero is time-like. But you can have another, another uh, more interesting type of frames, which play a much more fundamental role in general relativity, which are so-called null frames. So null frames. So null frame instead uh, are uh, frames which, which consist of, say, vector fields L, L bar, uh, and then E1 up to En minus 1, if I am in N plus 1 dimensions. So these two are null, right? So G, L, L is G, L, L bar, L bar is equal to 0, right? Uh, you also normalize them. Of course, you cannot do anything like in Riemannian geometry where you take one of them to have length one because they are null, right? But I can, I can normalize L and L bar so that this is equal, say, minus two, right? So for example, if I'm again in Nikovsky space, I can take vector fields, so this is a null con at the point, 
right? I can take this to be L, this to be L bar, and I normalize them such that the length, uh, the scalar product between them is minus two. And then the other ones, the other ones will have to be space-like because they are orthogonal to these two. They will have to sit here somewhere. They will be space-like. And I can pick them like a Riemannian geometry to be orthonormal. So this will be orthonormal among themselves and perpendicular to L and L bar. So null frame, which I, I'll talk a lot about null frames in, in these lectures, is really defined like this. Right? So f f for example, here, here is a, an example of a null frame in Minkowski space. If I take dt minus dr, where r is a radial vector field, so I call this L bar, and dt plus dr, I call it L, and the other ones will be perpendicular to these two and not on all among themselves, right? So that's, that's a null frame. And as you'll see, these null frames play a much more fundamental role than the orthonormal frames. <laughs> all right, so uh, Cartan formalism, well, again, this is exactly like a Riemannian geometry. If I have a frame, I can define, so if I have the frame, let me do it here. So if I have a frame, I can define uh, the, co the connection, right? So I have, say, in the Riemannian geometry, E1, En, and I define the gammas, which are the derivative of the frame taken with respect to the frame. So the components of the derivative with respect to the frame, where the derivative is, of course, a covariant derivative. So it's a, induced by the Levi-Civita connections. And then uh, the Cartan formalist tells you that, that somehow derivative, so gamma plus gamma. So you get equations which are the Cartan equations, which look like this. Oh, sorry, equal to curvature. So on the right hand side, you have the Riemann curvature tensor. Okay, so I'm, I'm writing it just very formally. We'll have, whenever we need, I'll write it more explicitly. But, but uh, uh, the, there is, uh, these are the fundamental equations in Riemannian geometry, and of course they play a fundamental role also in Lorentzian geometry, except again that I will be using, uh, instead of orthonormal frame, as uh, in Cartan formalism, I'll be using null frames. Uh, foliations, right? So another thing which is extremely important in, in problems in general relativity is to have uh, to have uh, uh, foliations, so one kind of foliations would be given by in Minkowski space, for example, is just t equal constant, and uh, in in for a general Lorentzian manifold, uh, I the role of t is placed by what is called the time function. In other words, a function such that the exterior derivative, so dt, the differential of t, is time-like at every point, right? So that's a time-like function. And uh, then, of course, I can talk about t equal constant. So this gives me a foliation by space-like hypersurfaces, right? So this will be uh, on, a, on an arbitrary Lorentzian manifold. Uh, another kind of foliation, which is, in fact, even more important, is given by so-called optical functions, so optical functions. So instead of time functions, I'll talk about optical functions. So these are functions uh, given by, by you. Uh, so sorry, optical function is a function u, which verifies the iconal equation. So uh, gij diu dju is equal to 0. In fact, actually, to distinguish between Riemannian and Lorentzian geometry, I'll use, instead, uh, most of the time, I'll use uh, Greek indices, right? So this will be d alpha of u, d beta of u is equal to 0, right? So this means nothing else that if I take the exterior derivative of u, so if I take the differential of u, then g du du is equal to 0. In other words, if I look at u equal constant, Right, the, the differential of u is in the, in the direction of the gradient of u, right? But this means that somehow the gradient of u is also orthogonal to itself, which means, of course, that, that uh, du itself is tangent to the hypersurface. And this, of course, can only happen if u 
equal constant does not look like this at all, but looks like a, like a null hypersurface. So u equal constant is in fact null. It's null. So in other words, if I solve the i coral equation, which is of course a, an equation extremely important in all sorts of uh, branches of mathematics and physics, if I solve the i coral equation, I get a solution u, the level surfaces of u will give me a foliation by null cons, right? So for example, Again, in Minkowski space, I can have a foliation given by, uh, for example, like this, where all these are null cons. Okay, so I can foliate part of the space time by null cons, and and uh, 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 these foliations again are going to play a, 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 a major role in uh, in uh, our discussions. Finally, a little bit about uh, the role of Riemannian geometry. I already said that if you have a space-like hypersurface, you immediately have equations which, which are typical to Riemannian geometry. So you have Riemannian geometry because the metric induced on a space-like hypersurface is, re is actually Riemannian. So the, the geometry on space-like hypersurface is Riemannian. Uh, and therefore, lots of concepts that come in Riemannian geometry will be of, of great use also in general relativity. But uh, there is another kind of foliation which also is extremely important, maybe even more important, and will play a role in, in our discussions, which is, say, foliations which are obtained either by taking an intersection with t equal constant, so imagine that you have a time function, t equal constant on a manifold, and you intersect that with uh, null hypersurfaces, like this. Right? So the intersection then consists of two surfaces, which are Riemannian, because the metric induced will be Riemannian. Right? So we call them, so if this is u equal constant, then uh, these surfaces will be called uh, S of TU. So, so if I'm in one percent dimension, this will be one n minus one dimensional. There will be the metric induced is Riemannian, and this kind of uh, the the geometry. So this is also has the advantage of being com compact, right? So these are compact Riemannian manifolds, and they again they play a major role in uh, our discussions. All right. So uh, finally, to finish with this introduction. I want to say a little bit more on null hypersurfaces. So again, uh, the null hypersurfaces can be given by, op by these uh, optical functions, in other words, function u, such that g du du is equal to zero. But they also arise naturally as boundaries of future and past sets. Right? So if I have a set here and I look at the future, the boundary of the future is null, at least in the portion of the boundary which is regular. So if it's, if it's, if, if there are countries, so these are typically ruled by, the, by null geodesics, uh, right, which I, so the, the boundaries of future are ruled by null geodesics, right, so in other words, they, are, they can be constructed by, by putting null geodesics together. So for example, if you start with the two surface, uh, you, you, take, you take the null geodesic perpendicular to the two surface at every point, and that gives you a null, a null hypersurface. Of course, you could have the problem that these null geodesics, which are perpendicular to S, at some point will intersect because you can have conjugate points or, or uh, cut locus. And then, then uh, the boundaries become more complicated, but I'm not going to discuss it. So as long as in the absence of this conjugate point on, and, and uh, cut locus points, these uh, null boundaries are smooth and they are given by null hypersurfaces. Uh, so let me end this with an interesting observation of Poincaré, who said, Parmi ces axioms implicites, il est un qui semble mériter quelque attention, parce que en, en l'abandonnant, on peut construire une, quatre, une quatrième géométrie aussi cohérente que celle de Euclide, de Lobachevsky et de Riemann. Je ne citerai qu'un de ces théorèmes et je ne choisirai pas le plus singulier. Une droite réelle peut être perpendiculaire à elle-même. Okay. And of course, this is uh, what happens if you take, uh, if you take an null hypersurface, if you take the null geodesic, which is a, uh, a straight line in, uh, if you are in flat space, in Minkowski space, 
And this is, of course, perpendicular to itself relative to the induced Lorentzian geometry. So the Lorentzian geometry induced on a null hypersurface is actually singular. And it's very different from what happens in Riemannian geometry. And this leads to a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting mathematics, which, which uh, has been somewhat ignored by geometers. I would say that uh, uh, Poincaré is always his visionary and uh, is understood that this could be very important. And indeed, uh, the, the, these null hypersurfaces are extremely important in general relativity. OK, so with this, let me go now to the uh, uh, beyond uh, Lorentzian geometry. What is the geometric framework of general relativity? Well, you have Fields equations. Uh, so this is now, uh, now uh, obviously, you are looking now at Lorentzian. I'm always losing mine. Uh, we are looking at Lorentzian uh, manifolds, which, in addition to being just Lorentzian, they verify an equation. So general relativity is distinguished from Lorentzian geometry by this fact that you are interested only in Lorentzian metrics which verify an equation. So the equation is just uh, the Ricci. So as you know, if I have the Riemann curvature tensor and I, I take a trace with respect to the metric, I get the Ricci, Ricci tensor. And uh, so this is a two tensor. And the equation looks like this, minus 1 over 2g times the scalar curvature. So the scalar curvature, so this is Rick. Scalar curvature is obtained by taking one more uh, contraction with a metric G. And on the right hand side, you have uh, T, which corresponds to the input of some matter theory, which is present in, uh, in, uh, in our space time. Right? So that's, uh, these are the famous Einstein equations. And uh, I'm not going to talk directly about them. Partly because, so this part of the Einstein equations is sufficiently interesting in its own right. Uh, and in fact, most of the complications, there, there are lots of complications which have to do, of course, with the matter fields which are present. But in a sense, in mathematics, we, all, we always want to separate uh, uh, difficulties. So these are a set of difficulties, like, for example, you can have fluids, and you have all the difficulties that have to do with fluids, or you can have Maxwell equations, all sorts of other things that are on the right-hand side. And to simplify, I'm, I'm simply going to ignore that part. I'll put this equal to 0, which is, of course, makes perfect sense. So this will be, if you are to, to make an analogy with Maxwell theory, is, is studying electro pure electromagnetic waves without sources. Right? Makes perfect sense, and it's already very interesting. But in, in, in general relativity, this is also very hard. So in this case, it's very easy to see that the equations actually immediately imply that the Ricci has to be 0. So, uh, so the, the equations of interest in my lectures will be this one. So you have Ricci equal to 0. Conversely. Sorry? Conversely. Sorry? Conversely. What do you mean conversely? I mean, the top equation is equivalent to Ricci. Yeah, correct. So if t is equal to 0, these two are equivalent, indeed. OK, so, uh, so these are the equations so that uh, I would be interested in. And again, uh, mathematical is extremely rich. And you see the, uh, essentially all the important, most of the important parts of uh, sort of black hole theory have to do with these equations. Right? All right, so, uh, so l let me talk a little bit about the uh, character of these equations, what's special about these equations. So again, we have uh, Ricci flat, Ricci of g is equal to 0. And uh, the first thing of interest is, is what you mean by a solution. So we have to solve this equation. This is a complicated equation. I mean, if you, if you think about how the Riemann curvature tensor is defined, it involves uh, two derivatives of the metric plus nonlinear terms. So two derivatives plus nonlinear terms. But these two derivatives also come up in a complicated fashion. And uh, if, you don't, if you don't take precautions, you don't see any interesting partial differential equations showing up here. 
To make it into an interesting partial differential equation, you have to take into account another important fact about this equation, which is that there are diffeomorphism invariant. In other words, if I have a solution G, if, if I have a metric G, I cannot distinguish between, between uh, phi star of G, where phi is any diffeomorphism of the manifold to itself. So 1 plus n, 1 plus n. Right? So, uh, so a solution is actually a class of equivalents of solution modulo uh, the, this huge group of diffeomorphism of the manifold. Right? So these are general diffeomorphisms. That's why the Einstein equations are called generally covariant. <laughs> so if you take that into account, then solving the equations, you, you have an additional the initial bonus that comes from it, which is that I can try to solve it relative to a specific coordinate system or a specific diffeomorphism. So I, I, I look for solutions together with a class of, together with a specific, with possibly a specific kind of diffeomorphism which will allow me to solve. And the simplest way is, uh, the simplest observation of this type is that if I assume a coordinate system, so you see, pick, this, this covariance allows me somehow to say, well, there are, I can solve them by equations in a specific coordinate system, right? So if I pick up the coordinate system to verify this very simple equation where this down version here is, uh, is nothing else but the Laplace Beltrami operator, but associated to the metric, which is now, of course, not Riemannian, so you don't get the usual Laplacian but you get uh, what is called the wave operator, right? So this is defined exactly in the same way as in Riemannian geometry, except that because of the metric, so these are covariant derivatives applied to X alpha. <laughs> and this operator is what we call the wave operator, right? It's exactly like the Laplacian, but it, it's uh, much more complicated because of the signature. Is that what people call also harmonic coordinates? Yeah, this, this uh, in Riemannian geometry are called harmonic coordinates. It's interesting that actually harmonic coordinates were discovered earlier <laughs> in physics than in geometry, right? So these were known. In fact, even Einstein, even Einstein himself had some knowledge of them, but they were certainly understood by uh, people in, in the French school, like Yvon Choquet-Brois, which used it in, in, uh, in her famous result on, on existence for solutions of the Einstein equation. Right? I'll talk more about this in a second. Okay, in any case, once you, once you have, uh, once you fix up your coordinate system, then these equations take this form. And as you see here, you have once again some kind of wave operator applied to all components of the metric. So here, I'm, I'm, I'm fixing the components of the metric. I apply this, and uh, I get something on the right-hand side, which is a complicated expression which involve the metric and first derivative of the metric and say it's quadratic in the first derivative of the metric, right? So in any case, it's recognizable. The character of the equation is now recognizable. This is what we call nonlinear system of wave equations. It's clearly hyperbolic, right? So this is, this, this is what one calls the hyperbolic character of the equations, right? So I, I'll talk more about things like this later, but for the moment, I just want to give a, a general introduction to in these things. Uh, okay, so equations are hyperbolic. Right? That's what we discover. We discover that if we use the, uh, the gauge dependence of the Einstein equations, if we use it to our, advances, uh, to our uh, advantage, you can actually show that the equations are hyperbolic. Now, being hyperbolic, it means you have to solve sort of similar problem as you do, say, for example, <coughs> If you are in Minkowski space, right? So the metric is, is then just a Minkowski metric. Then uh, say I want to solve just the inversion of phi is equal to zero. So the inversion being again, this is uh, minus d t squared plus Laplacian of phi is equal to zero. And uh, typically one solve this by by choosing initial conditions. Uh, say t equals zero. It can be any space like hypersurface. You can take initial condition of any space I have, but in, for simplicity, you just take t equals zero, and then you get uh, phi of zero x is, say, f of x, and dt of phi of zero x is g of x. <laughs> so this you prescribe, and then you show that there exists a unique solution that solves this equation, right? So this is 
This is uh, for the simplest possible equation. Of course, you can do that for much more general classes of equations. Yes? Uh, does the, the formalism of, uh, of uh, general relativity is the same that then uh, the formalism emulator used to demonstrate uh, theorems about physics? Yeah, there is, of course, a connection, obviously, but I'm not going to get into this now. Okay. Right? Yeah, but of course. Uh, you know, they can't, there are conservation laws and all sorts of things that have to do with Eminota. There is a whole theory, but I, I, will, I will not talk about this now. I mean, here I want to talk about something very simple, which is that, that uh, you can solve the wave equation, unique solutions for the wave equations you find if you prescribe these two initial conditions. Right? So you want to do something similar in general relativity. So in general relativity, uh, the role of this F, so the role of this T equals zero hypersurface and these two initial condition is taken by what is called initial data sets. So an initial data set is, will consist into a space, some three dimensions. So let's say we are in four dimensions for simplicity, right? So we are in four dimensions. So this will have to be three dimensional, starting one dimension less. This will have to be a Riemannian metric because I know that if I can solve the Einstein equations, I, I will get a Lorentzian manifold. And this original hypersurface sigma zero embedded into it will have to be space-like. And therefore, this uh, as an input will have to be a Riemannian metric. And this will correspond to the time derivative of the Lorentzian metric. This is called the second fundamental form of the original uh, space-like hypersurface, right? So, so typically, I prescribe, I prescribe uh, uh, g0 and k0 and sigma zero, and uh, I solve for the constraint equations. So then uh, uh, there is a, uh, uh, unlike in this situation, uh, you have to do a little bit more work about the constraints. In other words, the constraints cannot be, the constraints cannot be uh, uh, prescribed arbitrarily. They have to be something which is called the constraint equation, which is very much like in Maxwell's theory. In Maxwell's theory, when you prescribe the electric and magnetic field, you prescribe it together with a constraint, which in that case is very simple because it's linear. In this case, it's much more complicated. It's a, it's a nonlinear constraint. And this actually, the uh, study of solutions and the character of these constraint equations has led to a lot of developments in Riemannian geometry. This you could view, the constraint equation, initial data set constraint equations can be viewed as a subject in Riemannian geometry, right? And uh, I won't talk about this at all. But I just want to tell you, for example, that the so-called positive mass theorem, which is a famous theorem in Riemannian geometry, played a major role not just in connection w w where it started in general relativity, but in many other, in, in, in any other, many other applications of, uh, of uh, problems in Riemannian geometry. And they have to do somehow uh, with this, uh, uh, with the geometry of these uh, initial data sets together with the constraint equations. Okay, once you, have, once you have set up the initial conditions, you can talk about solving the equations in the same way as you solve it here. Of course, this is a linear problem. That one is nonlinear. It's much harder. But nevertheless, it turns out that uh, there is a very general theory of nonlinear hyperbolic equations, nonlinear wave equations, which allows you to solve uh, the Einstein equations in the wave coordinate. So you have to use the wave coordinate conditions. You start with initial data, you construct a space-time at least for some time. It will have to be local to start with because typical nonlinear problems can develop singularities. Uh, but uh, you can solve it for uh, some time. You can also talk about the maximal future development. In other words, uh, this, will be, this will be something similar to what happens for uh, simple ordinary differential equations. Suppose I have x dot is equal to x squared. If I want to solve it, some initial data, x of 0, is given, then obviously I can only solve it for a local time, local amount of time, because you can have singularities. But you can talk about the maximal time of existence of solution of this equation. Right? And the analogous of this notion, and this, by the way, is not just for this equation, for any nonlinear ordinary differential equations, you can talk about maximal time of uh, existence. And the same concept can be uh, discussed in the context of uh, these uh, initial data sets. So in other words, I can start with an initial data set, 
and I can, I can talk about developments, and I can talk about the maximal development, right? Okay, and then somehow uh, the entire subject of general relativity, you could say, is really nothing else but a discussion of the character of this maximal development. So the, the theorem, which was proved by, by Yvonne Choquet in 1952 and complemented by Geroch in, 19, uh, in 1969, is that to any initial data set, you can associate a maximal future global hyperbolic development. Global hyperbolic development, what does it mean? It simply means that the space-time that you have constructed, by the way, all this concept came in the French school, by the way, I should say. This, this, even the formulations of the initial value problem as a hyperbolic problem was really not well understood until Loret, choquet and, uh, and many other people in, in the French school. So th this is really a good place to talk about it because uh, it's a... Uh... So anyway, so this was... Uh, this, uh, the, the, the hyperbolic character of the equations were, was de definitely... Uh, uh, an important part of, of the work of Loret and certainly uh, Yvonne choquet bruat And then uh, bruhat Geroch. Uh, you associate with initial data, you can associate this maximal future hyperbolic development. Uh, that simply means global hyperbolic development. By the way, global hyperbolicity was defined by Loret, in fact. So, but for us, it simply means global hyperbolic, it simply means that the space like you are starting with, when you construct your space time, the, this surface sorry, this three-dimensional Riemannian surface together with a, with a uh, uh, first and second fundamental form of, of this uh, is, uh, 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 is uh, what do you want to say? So I want you to say that uh, relative to the space time that you have constructed, this is a Cauchy hypersurface, right? So global hyperbolicity is something very, very simple. When you solve the Einstein equations, Using PDE techniques, you automatically construct a globally hyperbolic uh, uh, development. Okay? So that's part of the construction itself. All right, so, uh, okay, so again, you have this maximal global hyperbolic development. You can associate with any initial data, and therefore what's left is to discuss the character of this maximal future hyperbolic development. It sounds simple, but well, certainly not, right? So let's talk now about the next step after this. Uh, so the, the, the next thing that needs to be said before uh, going into real problems is to talk about possible, what kind of solutions you could have in general relativity. Of course, solving the equations in general is very complicated. And it's really the role of mathematicians to solve the equations without necessarily producing explicit solutions. But the physicists who started first to work on this, they wanted to look at explicit solutions, right? So that's natural, and we don't blame them. In fact, it's extremely important, right? So, uh, so how do you look for specific solutions? You have to look for symmetries. You, you have to assume that somehow you have, you, you have all sorts of additional symmetries. So what kind of symmetries you can have? Well, the, the symmetries in, in geometry are given typically by vector fields which are killing or conformal killing. In other words, they generate, so these are vector fields which generate uh, a one parameter group of, uh, of diffeomorphism which uh, uh, correspond to isometries or conformal isometries, right? So that's how you look. So when you look for symmetries in, in uh, general relativity, you follow the same idea. You look for solutions which have uh, additional killing or conformal killing vector fields. The simplest case is actually when you have a lot more, not just one, it's spherical symmetry. So you look for solutions with spherical symmetry. <laughs> right? So it, it, in that case, you have an action. It's more than just uh, um, one or two killing vector fields. It's, uh, it's an action of, uh, of uh, uh, the SON uh, group. Right, I'm not going to say much more about it. There is a very simple definition of spherical symmetry. In which case, uh, once you impose spherical symmetries, the Einstein equations become much simpler, and you can actually solve them explicitly in certain cases. So I'll say more about it in a second. Uh, but of course, you can also look for solutions which have just one symmetry or two symmetries. So say x1, x, x1, and then x1, x2, and so on and so forth. And you get uh, you get more and more and more simplifications uh, as you go. Right. So. 
if you impose enough symmetries, in fact, you reduce the Einstein equations which are partial differential equations, you reduce it to just ordinary differential equations, for example. But you can also, uh, if you have one, for example, typically, you have to think about having one such killing or conformal killing, typically killing, uh, having one such killing vector field reduces the dimension. So suppose you are in one plus one dimension and you have one symmetry, you reduce it to n dimension. So you reduce the problem from n dimension to, to one plus n dimension. Maybe I should say one plus n minus one, right? For example, right? So you, 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 you simplify the equations quite a bit, but they still be, they could still be very complicated. Spherical symmetry makes, a, makes life much easier. And uh, in the case of uh, uh, the Einstein equations, of course, the simplest, the simplest solution is the Minkowski space itself, right? The Minkowski space certainly verifies this equation. So Minkowski space is a special solution of the Einstein equations in vacuum. But then uh, there are more such solutions. The, the most in interesting class of such solutions was discovered by Schwarzschild. So here is a example. So this is a Minkowski metric in polar coordinates. So you see the difference between this and Schwarzschild is that you add these terms here uh, where m is some, some uh, constant and you, you want to take it positive. So m can be also zero. The case equal to zero, it's exactly the case of Minkowski space. But you see that the moment you introduce a non-zero m, the, uh, the solution becomes somewhat more complicated. The character of the solution was actually, even though the solution was discovered by Schwarzschild in, two, in 1915, immediately after Einstein, it took more than 50 years to really understand uh, the character of the solution. Okay, all right, but the next, so this was discovered in 1915. The next one was discovered much later in 1963, which is a famous Kerr family of solutions. So let me, let me now go to here. So this is how the Kerr solution looks like in coordinates, which are again like polar coordinates, T, R, T, T, and phi. These are called the boyle linquist coordinates. And you see the metric is more complicated now, but it's still amazingly explicit. This is one of the, probably the most remarkable solution. I mean, we, we should discuss, but I think it's one of the most remarkable solutions in all of physics, because it's clearly a solution of a nonlinear problem, highly complicated nonlinear problem. It's explicit. Uh, Right, because all these coefficients are calculated by this very simple trigonometric formula. So it's explicit and it has huge impact, right? I mean, basically, whatever we think about black holes today are essentially based on these solutions, right? So showing that this is a solution is not so, not so easy at all. I mean, if you try, you probably spend at least a few days to try to calculate and show that to indeed it, the solution. Of course, if you use a calculator, it's much smarter. You will probably get it in a few hours. The form is simplified. Sorry? If you use differential forms, makes it. It makes it easier, certainly, if you, if you introduce correct. All right, anyway, so this is, this is uh, the family. Let me make some remarks about it. First of all, you can see that this is asymptotically flat. So you see it asymptotically flat from the, the character of this uh, of these uh, uh, coefficients here, you see that when r goes to infinity, right, that r goes to infinity, you get closer and closer to Minkowski space. So that's just standard to see, to see immediately. Yes? How does the, this equations of homogeneous, excuse me? Homogeneous, homogeneity, sorry, how does uh, in units? I'm not, I'm not look, looking at units now, right? I mean, in terms of physical units, you mean? No, no, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm writing it as purely a mathematical solution, right? At this stage, you can always put units, it's not. But I'm not going to do it. All right, so anyway, so the first observation is that, uh, again, this is asymptotically flat. So it's an asymptotically flat solution. It has symmetries uh, because you can see immediately that since these coefficients do not depend on time, right? You can see it here, they don't depend on t. It means that d over dt in this coordinate, so the vector field d over dt in this coordinate is killing, right? Okay. So th this gives you that these solutions are in fact stationary. Stationary, by the way, I didn't say, I should have said it earlier. Stationary solutions means, yeah, I guess I didn't, uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, I'll discuss about stationarity later on. The important thing is that this vector field which is killing is also time-like, at least, 
as you go far away in the r direction, as r goes to infinity, it becomes certainly it's time-like. We'll discuss about the actual global behavior later on, but for the moment, it's stationary because this d over dt is time-like. Uh, the second observation is that it's also axisymmetric in the sense, again, that if I look at all these coefficients, they don't depend on the coefficients don't depend on phi, which means that d over d phi is a killing vector field, right? Okay, so this corresponds to a rotation. So this corresponds to a rotation. So these are, we say, are black holes which are rotating. Uh, the, you see that there is an extra parameter. Instead of m, that you have now two parameters. You have a and m. And in fact, this uh, set of solutions are supposed to be physical only in the regime a is strictly less than m. Uh, actually, sorry, less or equal to m. Equal to m is called the extremal case, right? All right, so uh, again, you can see that if a is equal to zero, you are reduced to Schwarzschild, and of course, if a is equal to zero, you are reduced to Minkowski space, right? So this is uh, the, the famous uh, two-parameter family of solutions of the Einstein vacuum equations, which verify all the interesting assumptions that you want. It's asymptotically flat, it's, uh, uh, and it has, it's, sta it's stationary, and it's also axisymmetric. All right, so now come... Uh, how much time? Uh, maybe I should take a few more minutes, and then we'll take maybe a break. Uh, so uh, here I want to talk about the, the major conjecture in general relativity. It's probably, uh, I mean, there are some others, but I would say that this is sort of the, uh, uh, the dream conjecture that you would like to solve. Okay? So what, what is this conjecture? So it's called the final state conjecture. So it says the following thing. It says that generic means not all. Th there could be some exceptions to this conjecture, right? So I say generically, of course, we don't know what that means at this stage. Of course, wh whenever you solve a major conjecture, you also have to define everything. In particular, you have to define what you mean by generic. But leave aside generic. Any asymptotically flat initial data set that you take, right? So it has to be asymptotically flat. has to be smooth, of course. But no, I make no other assumptions. Have maximal future development. So in other words, there is this global maximal development that I talked about before. Right? So you, you go as far as you can go. And here you are saying that this, uh, this maximal future hyperbolic uh, developments, uh, which are maximal extended solutions of the Einstein vacuum equations, so that's the same thing, look asymptotically in any finite region of space as a Kerr solution. Right? So, okay, so let me, let me uh, make it a bit more uh, graphic. So, uh, so you, you, you take an initial data set. You take a very general sigma 0, g0, k0. You take a very <laughs> a general initial data set, which is, of course, asymptotically flat and smooth in, in whatever sense. And you look at the maximum future hyperbolic development. Well, this tells you that the maximum future hyperbolic development is not finite. It doesn't terminate in finite time. It goes all the way to infinity, right? So this is the first major statement which is included in here. The notion of maximum, when, when, you, when we talked earlier about maximum future hyperbolic development, it could have been that if I look at a time-like curve, the time-like curve terminates in finite time. In other words, observers will die after finite time, right? So that means it's not a very, from a physical point of view, it's not a very interesting solution, right? So this is not an interesting scenario. So here, it tells you that in, in reality, what happens, you can go for infinite time. And, uh, but it's even more interesting is that what you see asymptotically will be just a finite number of care solutions, right? So asymptotic in, time. asymptotic in time, whatever that means, of course, you have to define the two, but, but say intuitively, it's pretty clear. So asymptotically in time, you are only going to see a finite number of care solutions, which are black holes. And they are, they are going away from each other, right? So because, in principle, they could have interacted before. They, when they interact, they form only one black hole. So if you have two that come together to form only one black hole, so asymptotically, you'll see only a finite number. In any compact region, in other words, you see only one care solution at most, right? And they could rotate. So that's why care, that, that's why the final states will, will be care. So, so what is rotate two black holes rotating around each other? Basically. Well, the conjecture says that this is not possible, right? But I'm not saying that the conjecture is true, of course. And, and generically, right? 
Yeah. Yeah, because then they will evaporate, uh, they will emit gravitational waves and they will kill. Correct. Yeah, correct. So the genericity is also very important in this business. But, uh, uh, but uh, uh, of course, you, you also can have uh, gravitational waves, which goes to infinity. Right. So what is the basis of this conjecture? Intuitively, it's very clear what it says. Somehow, uh, any solution would radiate energy at infinity. So these gravitational waves will be generated at infinity. And therefore, you will be left to stationary solutions. But the only stationary solutions, this is another conjecture we'll discuss in a moment, any stationary solution has to be a Kerr solution. That's another belief that people have. Okay? All right, so anyway, this is a conjecture. Now, I, I want to show you a little bit, before taking the break, I want to show you a little bit what is behind, what are, I mean, if you really try to understand this conjecture, you'll see that it consists on many, many things, which by themselves are extremely interesting. So, for example, <laughs> The first thing that you will have to connect it to this is that if the data is sufficiently small, in other words, of course, if I'm in Minkowski space, the Minkowski space obviously has no black holes. You don't see any care solution at, at the end of the day, right? It's just flat Minkowski space. So you, uh, you, you, in order to solve this, the first thing you would like to do is to see that if I have small data, in other words, if I make a small perturbation of Minkowski space. So by the way, the initial data of Minkowski space will be the metric here will be the Euclidean metric, so maybe I'll write it Euclidean, and this will be zero, right? So I start with Euclidean, and the second fundamental form is zero, right? And uh, then I want to make a small perturbation of this. The fact that a small perturbation leads to, leads to, uh, uh, doesn't lead to any, any black hole is what is called the stability of Minkowski space, right? So, so that's a statement which in itself is, is highly non-trivial. The second statement that uh, is hidden inside that conjecture is that large data, in other words, if I, if I take the data now sufficiently large, it may concentrate. So it actually can lead to a black hole, right? So it can lead to a stationary solution. So you could produce stationary solutions if the initial data is sufficiently la large. So this is called the problem of collapse, right? So for example, from a physical point of view, you know that if you have enough matter, uh, then uh, stars can, at some point, create neutron star, and if, if you have enough energy, you can create a black hole, right? So that's uh, the problem of collapse. You, you can see that it can be formulated <laughs> in pure mathematical terms, in a sense, and without matter. So this is just in vacuum, right? But these sort of things can happen, and we'll discuss it. <laughs> the next thing which is hidden in that conjecture is that all stationary states are care solutions. Right? So, you see, you, the care solution is just a family of solutions which happen to be stationary, but how do you know that all us as a stationary states are care solutions, right? So, uh, the conjecture tells you that you see at the end of the evolution, you see only care solutions, which means that, uh, that somehow all stationary solutions will have to be care, right? But this is by itself a highly non-trivial statement. There is no reason not to expect other solutions, right? So this has to be also studied as a mathematical problem. Care solutions are stable. So th this is another major thing, is that if the conjecture were to be true, then care solutions themselves will have to be stable, because if I make a small perturbation of a care solution, I can't get something crazy, right? Uh, so stability of the care solution is also part of this, uh, of this conjecture. And uh, but this circle is just uh, the soliton resolution conjecture. For exactly, exactly. It's exactly. It's a soliton resolution conjecture in the class for relativity. But with the difference, I mean, I mean, relative to the, the one that you guys are talking about, there is a small difference. But I'll, I'll talk about it. I mean, stability. Stability is a major difference because you, you do have stability of all these states. So the, the solitons are all stable. Right. So that, that could be a, anyway, well, we can discuss it. So, uh, uh, okay, so other things that are included in the final state conjecture, which, is, uh, which are huge conjectures in their own right, which is the cosmic censorship conjecture. So if this final state conjecture were to be true, then you should also uh, 
verify the cosmic censorship conjecture. Now, the cosmic censorship conjecture says something uh, which, again, can be made more precise, but I'll, I'll do it intuitively. You see, what happens in the, when you look at, the, say, Schwarzschild's, Schwarzschild metric? The Schwarzschild metric has, it can be drawn uh, by a diagram, which is called the Penrose diagram. I'm not going to talk, I mean, there is something here at infinity, but I don't care about. There is a, there is a black hole region, so this is uh, the separation, so this is black hole, and we'll talk more about it uh, in a second. So this is uh, uh, the part outside the black hole. So this is uh, the exterior region. This is a black hole. And once you are in the black hole, you reach a singularity. So this is something that the, the character of the solution that uh, we wrote down will tell you immediately that once I start up with an observer, in other words, I started with a time-like curve in the black hole, I will necessarily have to to uh, hit a singularity in finite time, right? Finite time means relative to the affine parameter, right, of the, of the corresponding time by curve. So in, in finite time, I, I hit a singularity. So in other words, it's something very objective that you can, uh, you can uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's a proper time of the, of the observer. Uh, on the other hand, if I'm here, right, and of course, if I'm stupid enough to move in this direction, I will also hit a singularity. But I, I have a chance to escape because I can go this way. Right? So, and I don't hit any singularities. So uh, because it's because of this fact that you, you can see that, that, that somehow the expectation is that outside black holes, you can't have singularities. Right? So the only singularities are hidden by horizons, which are the boundaries of these black holes. And, uh, uh, so this, of course, happens in the particular case of Schwarzschild solution. The generalization of it is called the cosmic censorship conjecture. So the generalization is that any initial data you take, again, generically, it, it, because there are counterexamples, but, but generically, any initial data you take, it will have to have, uh, be such that you can define a black hole region where you can have black holes, and so therefore you can have singularities in those regions. But outside the black holes, you can't have any singularities. So this will also have to be part of that conjecture, right? Of the of uh, the final state conjecture, and by itself is a, is you know, it's as difficult as any other conjecture in mathematics. In fact, maybe even more so, okay? And probably more interesting than any other conjecture in mathematics, unless you believe that the Riemann hypothesis is the most interesting conjecture in the world. Uh, you have to admit that there are some other very hard and extremely interesting. All right. Anyway. Uh, the other thing that is also hidden here is a two-body problem. <laughs> Two and maybe more, because in fact, actually, this corresponds to the LIGO experiment. The reason LIGO experiments have to do with two black holes interacting, right? So uh, they, they get closer and closer to each other. They rotate around each other, and at some point, they coalesce, and they form a new black hole, right? So there is no mathematical theory of such a thing. At this stage, there is a lot of numerical evidence and asymptotic expansions, but there is no mathematical theory, right? But this is clearly also part of the conjecture. I mean, you, you will not be able to solve the conjecture if you don't understand how black holes interact, right? And of course, this has a clear and time, I mean, clearly uh, uh, clear physical significance uh, right now, right? Because of the LIGO experiments. All right, so uh, there is a lot of evidence for the conjecture. There is astrophysical conjecture, numerical, mathematical, uh, but we are extremely far from solving uh, anything like this. The mathematical, mathematical evidence, I'm not going to talk about this one, of course. Uh, this we know from, from a lot of, uh, I don't know, newspapers talk a lot about it, right? So we know that, that people believe that there are black holes all over the place, and therefore somehow, this conjecture has to be true. Uh, numerical. I think the most non-trivial part of the conjecture is the absence of singularities. Suppose that there are some singularities of mild type, which is the physical evidence we have against it. Yeah. yeah. But I agree. <laughs> I agree. But, yeah, but they are all connected in a sense. But they are all connected in a sense, right? I mean, the, the, this lack of singularity is connected to stability, for example. Stability is also, I mean, obviously, if you don't have stability, you don't have anything, right? 
you don't. Okay, well, we'll talk more about it. Anyway, so uh, so there, there is a, a, a simplifications, linear theory, one can do linear theory and one can be quite rigorous in linear theory, but that's a huge simplification because the equations are non-linear, highly non-linear. There is a symmetries, you can, you can take look at various symmetries and you reduce the problems to something much simpler. And uh, what I will talk about is the emergence of stronger mathematical techniques to deal with this, at least to some of these issues. All right, so then, may, let, I don't know, we should take maybe a three minutes break or? Okay, so, uh, so I, I talked about, uh, so introduction and I mentioned this main problem uh, uh, in general relativity which as it stands is much too, com much, too, uh, much too difficult and it contains a lot uh, of deep problems in their own right and uh, therefore uh, as mathematicians the only way we go when we have a huge problem is to divide it into smaller steps, right? Smaller problems. And uh, uh, so that's what I want to talk about now. I want to pick, uh, in particular I want to pick three issues, three questions where uh, I think one can uh, make uh, progress. By the way, here was uh, something else that I should have done in the first hour, uh, which has to do with the picture, the standard picture of gravitational collapse, uh, which is at large energy concentrations, right, uh, may lead to the formation of a dynamical black hole, which settles down by gravitational radiation to a Kerr or Schwarzschild black hole. So that's a kind of picture that you see here. But anyway, I'll, I'll make, I'll make the, some of these things more precise. Anyway, the, the important, the, the, what I want to get out of, uh, of the discussion in the first hour are three questions which we believe are difficult. They require new mathematical techniques and a lot of new ideas, but they are not impossible. I mean, they, they could in principle be solved and they would be uh, relevant in their own right. So the first one is that uh, the issue of collapse. How can you show, can you actually produce this situation where you start with data which are, as I said, not that small, so they are sufficiently large, but still regular in the sense that there are no black holes in them to start with. And how can I form a black hole later on? So this is a, the problem of collapse. And uh, there are now a lot of interesting results of this type, but we are very far away from a general understanding. But at least, at least we, we, we do understand uh, in some very interesting examples how collapse can happen. So that's the first question. Second, uh, the question of rigidity, which I mentioned earlier, are all stationary states of, uh, of, of the Einstein vacuum equations, are they care black holes? So this is the problem of rigidity, and it's the easiest in a sense. You'd think that it's the easiest problem. There are lots of problems like this in elliptic, in Riemannian geometry, and uh, you'd think that at least this could be, could be solved. Unfortunately, it still isn't. And then finally, there is the problem of stability, which is among them, I would say, the hardest. And uh, where we are still, uh, we made a lot of progress, I think, but we are still relatively far. But in all these problems, you can see that there is an emergence of mathematical techniques uh, that uh, deal with them. And fortunately, uh, hopefully, uh, they will, many of these problems will be solved. All right, so let me now, so this is, by, by the way, these this three problems is what I call uh, the reality of black holes. Because obviously, if any of these uh, statements will be wrong, then uh, physically, care, uh, physically black holes will not exist. So because they exist, we believe that they have to, they, they, all these results have to be correct. In other words, we should have the ability to collapse, right? Because after, after all, black holes have to form somehow. We have to have uh, uh, rigidity, in other words, the, 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 care, the black holes are really care black holes, or maybe care Newman if you have Maxwell equations involved, but uh, right now I'm doing everything vacuum. Uh, or uh, uh, and the stability, of course, if the, if the case solution is unstable, then obviously it's not an observable thing, right? So you, you think that in the, minim the minimum, these three things should be true. All right, so, uh, all right, so first of all, what is a general black hole now? So a general black hole has to be a stationary solution, right? Uh, stationary asymptotically flat, 
Einstein vacuum equations, right? So you are solving the equations we are talking about. And we are talking about the black hole, but the external part of the black hole. In other words, the visible part. So uh, black holes are not visible, but the part that communicates with the exterior. Uh, and the definition is that uh, an external black, hole, uh, 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 the vi external black hole is an asymptotically flat, globally hyperbolic, Lorentzian manifold, with boundary, diffeomorphic to the complement of a cylinder in R1 plus 3. Uh, and so this is one uh, very mild requirement. Uh, the most important one is that the metric has to, be, has to have an asymptotically time-like killing vector field T, namely a vector field such that the lead derivative with respect to this vector field of the metric G is equal to zero. Right? So that's the definition of a killing vector field. And it has to be asymptotically time-like because it, as we shall see, the Kerr solution has such a stationary solution, but which actually tilts and becomes space-like near the black hole, right? So it's only far away from the black hole that you can expect to have, uh, to have uh, real uh, time-like, that this vector field is time-like. And then there is another thing which is called completeness of null infinity, which means basically that there are no singularities in the exterior of the black hole. I am not going to... In the outside. Sorry, in the outside. There are no singularities in the outside. So that's basically... Uh, so the, the, the only important definition is really this one. So you just understand, so you, you stop the black hole at the horizon, you don't... Exactly, so the, the external part stops at the horizon. So yeah. you don't look inside the horizon. In, you in, inside the horizon you have a completely different behavior. By the way, this conjecture that I mentioned, right, the, the final state conjecture, involves only the exterior of black holes. Inside black holes you have lots of other conjecture, right, uh, that are equally difficult maybe. But, but how do you, I understand that you might want to avoid it, but how do you avoid this mathematically in terms of definition because so you, you, the fact that your space-time is not complete because there are some the basics which go inside the horizon. So. Yeah, but you have causality, you see. You, you still have causality. So when you solve partial differential equations, you are interested in causality. I mean, you, in other words, up to the boundary, everything is causal, right? So, you know, it's like here, right? Right, if I'm in a region like this for the wave equation, right, this is not complete, of course, because I can go this way. But from the point of view of solving the uh, uh, Einstein, well, solving the wave equation, all you care is what happens here, right? And you construct. So you take this. a black hole and stop it even earlier before the horizon. You know, you you, you remove. Actually, usually stop beyond the horizon. Actually. So this is the definition of a black hole. Yeah, sorry. Uh, if you if you if you stop be before the horizon, well, it will be the, just this business of uh, of uh, this completeness of null infinity. If you want, I mean, that will not be solved I anymore. Not will not be satisfied. Yeah. All right. Okay. So this this is all right. So now uh, a Kerr family is of course an example. Right. So again, I'm looking outside the region where. Uh, of the horizon, I'll, I'll say it in a moment what the horizon is. Anyway, this is just to remind you uh, how things are. The, the important thing in the discussion is this delta, which is r plus a squared minus 2mr. Now, uh, Schwarzschild solution, first of all. This is uh, Schwarzschild. This is a complete picture of the Schwarzschild solution with a, in the so-called conformal compactification, the Penrose diagram. So what the conformal compactification does for you is to allow to go to infinity with R. So an R goes to infinity, uh, but there is a way of conformally changing the metric so that all the directions, uh, all the important things, the, the causal structure is preserved. But uh, this way you get something finite. So R is finite here, right? So, uh, so this corresponds, in fact, to points at infinity in the physical, for the, the, the physical thing. Uh, this is also a null hypersurface. By the way, everything at 45 degrees here is null, right? So uh, if you have an observer, observer uh, which is timelike or causal, will hit uh, will hit uh, scry. But a null hyper a null geodesics at 45 degrees will hit scry. The other ones, a timelike, will will hit there at the point at i plus infinity, which corresponds to another type of infinity. But the important thing to see here is that there is a horizon. So there is r equal to 2m. You see it, r equal to 2m comes, of course, in the metric. 
r equal to 2m is not a singularity as you might think, because you see you have 1 minus 2m over r to the minus 1 dr squared. It's not a singularity. It's actually what is called a horizon. Now, this is what I mentioned earlier, that, uh, that even though this metric was discovered very early on in, in 1915, it took about 50 years to understand the character of, the, of that singularity. And people were extremely confused. In fact, Einstein was really confused about it. Apparently, he had some discussions with Adamar when he was in Paris, uh, where <laughs> Adamar was, was bugging him exactly about that singularity. And Einstein was very upset because he couldn't answer. Anyway, uh, uh, so there was, there was a lot of questions, apparently, in, in, in mathematical community in, in Paris about that singularity. It took a long time. Anyway, it was understood. By, by the uh, 60s, it was understood. Uh, it is understood in that that, uh, that singularity is only, has only to do with the coordinates. It's because you are using a specific coordinate system, which is good away from this horizon. Uh, it's used in, in this region. By the way, it's also good in this region. If you go for r less than 2m, you can also put this, the, this, uh, uh, this metric is still uh, relevant in that region. But of course, it's not relevant at r equal to 2m. But you can change. You can write down another system of coordinates in which that uh, singularity is not there anymore. It, and in fact, this is completely regular. So actually, the, the complete. Uh, extension of uh, the metric uh, was found much later, and we now have these beautiful pictures. You have uh, a part r larger than 2m, another part r larger than 2m here, and you have the region r less than 2m, and the singularity at r equal to 0. You can see again at the metric that at r equal to 0 is a problem, and indeed at r equal to, r equal to 0 is a true singularity. You have that the Riemann curvature tends actually becomes infinite. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, we get scalars quantities which are formed from curvature, which then, which becomes infinite at r equal to zero. Yes. Uh, does the black hole rot is rotating? No, no, no. This is a Schwarzschild solution. It doesn't rotate, okay. right? So this is uh, okay. This is the external part of the black hole, and you see that everything is organized around r. So r, I r is less than two m corresponds to the black hole. R equal to zero is a singularity. R Less than 2m is black hole. Our larger event horizon is exactly r equal to 2m. So that's the, the boundary between the exterior region and the, the, the black hole region. If you are in black hole, you necessarily fall into a singularity. In other words, any time black curve in the black hole, if you extend it towards the future, it will go to that r equal to 0, which is singular. And therefore, everybody dies in, in the black hole. If you are here and you are careful, you survive for all time. You go for infinite time. Of course, nobody lives for infinite time, but that's for other reasons. Anyway, so this is a, this is a, uh, uh, this is a picture, right? So uh, uh, r larger than 2m. By the way, r equal to 3m is also something very important. Uh, there is something uh, very important happening at r equal to 3m, but maybe that's not the time to say it now. Maybe I'll say it later. What happens at r equal to 3m? So it's another, in other words, it's another important value of r, of r. And then, of course, there is r equal to infinity, which corresponds to these boundaries here and here and here and there. Right? Okay. The Kerr solution is similar in the external part. So the external parts are very similar. You don't terminate at r equal to 2m. You terminate instead at r plus which is the root of the delta polynomial r plus a squared minus 2mr, right? You, you see that there are two roots. One is this, r equal r minus. That's a, mi that's a smaller root. And the higher root is r plus, which corresponds to the horizon. Now, inside the black hole, you have all sorts of new phenomena. And there is a very interesting, there are all sorts of interesting new results in mathematics. They have to do with the character of this r equal r minus. It's called the Hoshi horizon. It's not a singularity. And the question is whether it's stable or not. And there are all sorts of very interesting issues connected to this. But again, we are only interested in the external part, so I'm not going to talk about it. So the external part, again, the boundary is r equal to r plus. You see that this is a causal region, right? And uh, this will be a space-like hypersurface. And of course, you, you'd like to, for example, if you, start stab if you do stability, you'd like somehow to start with initial data here. And, and see uh, the evolution. And we'll discuss about it later on. All right, so that's external part again. Uh, this is a picture of the time-like 
stationary killing vector field that I mentioned we have in care. There is this D over DT, which looks like this. In other words, look exactly like in Minkowski space. This is a part of the, of the black, of the external part of the black hole, which looks like Minkowski space, right? So because, uh, because of the asymptotic flatness, as you move with R going to infinity, you become more and more Minkowskian. And therefore, this T also looks perpendicular, just exactly like in Minkowski space. But as you approach the horizon, you see the T tilts and becomes time-like. In the, in the Schwarzschild solution, this doesn't quite happen. T actually remains tangent to, uh, to the horizon. Okay? So, uh, uh, in other words, it, it's not time-like anymore. It's not strictly time-like. It becomes null. And that has consequences. All right, so this is uh, the region where T becomes space-like. It's called the ergo region, and it has a lot of physical and mathematical uh, uh, significance. Particularly, it means that somehow the energy associated to T, but we know that energies are always associated to time, like uh, killing vector fields, right? So this has to do with Noether's theorem. Uh, the fact that this is space-like in this region, it means you can extract energy from the black hole. So, uh, so this, is, this actually has huge significance, uh, both from a physical point of view. Mathematically, it, it creates huge problems because typically the energy, which is associated to a, with a time-like Keeling vector field, has coercivity properties. And this coercivity is unfortunately violated when T becomes space-like. So there are all sorts of issues about this. There are also the Strabnal geodesics, which I'm not going to talk about it now. It's connected with what was before r equals 3m, I mentioned earlier, but I will not talk about it now. Okay, so these are the tests of reality. Again, the rigidity, stability, and collapse. Rigidity does a care family, exhaust all possible uh, vacuum black holes. So again, stationary, because black holes are by definition stationary. Uh, stability is a care family stable under arbitrary small perturbation, right? And collapse can black holes form starting from reasonable initial configurations. So this has to do with formation of sharp surfaces. So I hope to talk about it, uh, all of them. I will not talk on, in details. So my hope is that I will later on talk in details about each one of them. But for the moment, I want to give you sort of a general, a general view of each one of them. All right, so they all can be viewed from the point of view of the initial data formulation. So we start with initial conditions. For, for example, the problem of collapse you can formulate it as a problem in which you start up with initial data which are very reasonable. There are no black holes initially. And then you want to produce black hole later on. Stability, again, is a, is a problem that has to do with the initial data because you can start with the initial data set of care, right? And make a small perturbation, make a small change. And you want to know what happens in the long, long range. Particularly, you don't want to have singularities, lava. So this, this, you see, the problem of stability has also a problem of, of singularities because it, even this could have singularities. Right? Anyway, so uh, uh, and then uh, uh, I will start now talking uh, a little bit about each one of these problems. Right. So let me talk about rigidity first. So the rigidity is a care family exhaust all stationary asymptotically flat. All right. So what? do we know about this? So first of all, th there is a case which is completely understood, which is a static case. The static means, so we have a stationary solution. In other words, there is a Keeling vector field, right? So there is a stationary Keeling vector field, which is T. So in other words, we have a solution of the Einstein equations, which has a Keeling vector field, which is, which is time-like, at least far away. Right? In other words, in the, asymptot in the asymptotically flat region or in the region that becomes more and more flat. Now, if you make another assumption about T, which is that uh, the T is called T is hypersurface orthogonal. So it's orthogonal on hypersurfaces at every point. Uh, you, you can find a hypersurface, a regular hypersurface on which T is orthogonal. This is sort of an integrability condition, and it's always verified in Schwarzschild, but not in care. So it's not true in care, but it's true in Schwarzschild. And with that condition, with that extra condition, you can actually show that the, the, the solutions have to be Schwarzschild solutions. So the only static solutions are Schwarzschild. So this is well understood, right? The next thing is uh, 
axially symmetric case, there is a beautiful result of Car Carter Robinson. It goes back a long time ago, and there have been many other, many other developments, simplifications, and extensions of that result. In fact, it's a result in Riemannian geometry, right? The point being that uh, if you assume not only stationarity, but also, also axial symmetry. So you, you take solutions of the Einstein vacuum equation, which are static and axisymmetric, right? So of course, care is axisymmetric also. Then you are in care, right? So this reduces to a problem about harmonic maps, in fact. Uh, so it's a purely, purely uh, Riemannian geometry problem of, uh, of uh, harmonic maps, rigidity of harmonic maps, and that's why it's true, right? Okay, then there is another result, which is due to Hawking. It's really not a result, it's just an observation. So this is an observation that if you, in addition, assume as analyticity, then, uh, then you can reduce the general case. In other words, uh, the stationary case without axis symmetry, you can reduce it to this case. And therefore, because of Carter Robinson, you are in care. Okay, so that's, that's his result. So this was viewed by people in physics as being the definitive result on rigidity, because once you have this, you are done, All right? Except, of course, that this assumption of analyticity is kind of no justification for it whatsoever. But how does it work, or why is analyticity? Well, it, it, you cannot assume valid analyticity. No, how, how can you use analyticity to reduce uh, okay, so the, the, the proof goes like this. Let me, let me tell you the, roughly how the proof goes. So you take, you take that T, so you, you have a stationary solution. You have a T, you can define the horizon, right? That can always be defined starting from, starting from infinity, right? So remember that has something to do with completeness of, of, uh, of sky, right? So this, anyway, so this is a, a very, very weak argument. I mean, a very soft argument that gives you the horizon. Okay, then you, you can also show, it's also a very soft argument to show that T has to be uh, tangent to the horizon. So it, it's not null anymore, it, it, it actually is space-like, but it's tangent to the horizon. Once, it it, it, once you have a, a killing vector field on the horizon, it, you can say that it generates a rotation on the horizon, okay? So you, you find a rotation exactly along the horizon and now you, you use the Einstein equations and analyticity, in other words, koshi kovalevsky to extend this in the interior, and that's it, right? So that's, you get, so in other words, you, you show the existence of a second killing vector field, which is a rotation based on, on the fact that you can, by a soft argument, you can construct one exactly on the horizon, right? Okay, but the problem is, the problem is analyticity. Why, why are you allowed to assume analyticity, okay? So, uh, well, okay, you can say, if I am away from the ergo region, this is a very reasonable assumption because stationary solution, so if I have the Einstein equations together with a time-like Keenic vector field, then the equations become, the equations become elliptic. So the, the Einstein equations can be reduced to elliptic equations in the region where T is time-like. I mean, very much like the wave equation, right? I, if I have, a solution of the wave equation, dt squared plus Laplacian of phi equal to zero. And if I know that phi is stationary, that doesn't depend on time, then I'm left with just the Laplace equation. So it's, it becomes elliptic. The same thing here. This becomes elliptic, and therefore we know that even nonlinear elliptic, very general nonlinear elliptic equations have analytic solutions, right? So, so this is a reasonable argument. In fact, it can be made, it can be made per perfectly uh, Correct mathematically. But this argument only works in, in this region where T is, is uh, time-like. When it becomes space-like, it's not true anymore. In fact, the, the equations become hyperbolic again. So in that region, the Einstein equations under the assumptions that there is a Keenic vector field, since T is not time-like but space-like, the corresponding equations will be hyperbolic. No, no analyticity whatsoever, okay? In fact, it's even worse because there is a transition between elliptic and, and hyperbolic this is, uh, these are the hardest problems in partial differential equations, the ones where you have these transitions, right? In fact, they are not understood even in much, much simpler cases. So his argument is completely faulty. I mean, in fact, it's not entirely without merit because it definitely shows 
that there can be no other explicit solutions of the Einstein equations, right? Because analytic, I mean, we know that the case solution is analytic. So if you are looking for other explicit solutions, you are not going to find them, right? That's basically what Hawking tells you. But certainly it does not answer the problem. Okay, so let, let me tell you what we know now. So analyticity is not reasonable as an assumption, and therefore uh, you have to do something else. And it turns out that, uh, so what you have to do is, of course, forget about analyticity. Yeah, by the way, there is another, yeah, okay, so forget. Forget about analyticity, analyticity makes no sense. Uh, so you want to, uh, it turns out that the problem becomes much, much more difficult. I mean, once you don't have analyticity, it's infinitely more difficult and you have to use a full Einstein equation somehow. You cannot anymore do these kind of soft arguments. Uh, so, uh, so there are a few results. Actually, maybe I'll mention the most interesting result. Uh, there are some results that I, I have in collaborations with, uh, with Ionescu and also with uh, Alexakis and Ionescu. Uh, this one, maybe I'm not going to explain it now, uh, but this one can be easily explained, so I'll, I'll do that. So the result, and th this is, we have many versions of this result, I mean, with weaker assumptions in a sense, but, but roughly what, what the result says is that if you have a stationary solutions, which is sufficiently close to care, in a sense that you can make precise, in fact, you make precise by using the so-called Mars-Simon tensor, which I will maybe talk about next time. Uh, so you can make it precise. Uh, and so again, if you are close to care, and you can make it precise what you mean by closeness, then you must be in care. Okay? So it's per perturbatively, you are in care. All right, so here is a, a conjecture. So this is connected with uh, the question raised by Slava. Uh, so uh, the conjecture we have, so we have a lot of methods. I mean, this required completely new methods uh, in terms of the kind of things that are used in general relativity. And maybe I'll, I'll talk about it next time. But for the moment, I just want to say that at the end of our work on, on these things, we came up with a conjecture which we think is very reasonable. So the conjecture says uh, that uh, rigidity conjecture is true provided there are no t trap null geodesics. Right, so let me let me mention something about this uh, trap now geodesic. So uh, so a trap. So if you remember the picture that we had, this Penrose diagram of of Schwarzschild, let's say. Uh, so remember that I said that there is a region here which is corresponds to R. So this is R equal to two M but there is a region R equals 3M, okay, and then R larger than 3M. All right, so in the, if I'm in the region R larger than 3M, any null geodesic will have to move towards infinity, right? Or if I'm here, they will have to move inside the, inside the black hole. So in other words, if I forget about this region, any null geodesics either moves towards infinity or it moves in, inside, the, inside, the horizon, inside the horizon, therefore in the black hole. Once it goes into a black hole, I don't see it anymore. It's finished. So I don't care about it. Once it goes to infinity, I also don't care about it. But unfortunately, you can have null geodesics which stay arbitrarily close to R equal to 3M. In fact, there are uh, null geodesics, complete null geodesics, which actually ro rotate around R equal, rotate ar exactly on R equals 3M in the case of Schwarzschild. So, uh, and this creates huge problems, right? So it creates huge problem because somehow all the intuition they come from geometric optics is wrong, right? And that leads to issues in, in stability, but also rigidity. Okay, so anyway, the, 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 this presence of uh, trap null geodesics is, is very basic. Now, what we say here, in this conjecture is that we don't care about the trapped, in general about trapped null geodesics. We only care about those trapped null geodesics which are perpendicular to T, right? Now you could say, where does it come from? Well, it comes from well, our intuition, mathematical intuition, but more importantly, it comes from the fact that in care, there are plenty of trapped null geodesics, but there are no trapped null geodesics perpendicular to T. Right? So this is something that you have to check. I mean, there's no particular reason. It just simply happens to be true. 
right? So it's, it's uh, in other words, this explains this result because uh, if there are no t trabnal geodesics close to care, I mean, in care, there are also no t trabnal geodesics close to care. And therefore, it explains the result here, right? But more importantly, the conjecture is that this should be true in general. If there are no t trabnal geodesics, then you, you can actually do it, right? So the question is, can there be t trabnal geodesics? I see absolutely no reason to exclude them. I mean, I in other words, if you just think in terms of the original formulation of the rigidity problem, there is absolutely no reason to exclude such things. And of course, if, such a, if these things exist, it's probably true that uh, the conjecture is wrong. So in other words, I conjecture that, in fact, there are solutions of, of the Einstein equation such which are, which are uh, not care, okay? But they will probably be very unstable. They will probably be very unstable, yes, right. But they are there. I mean, if you want to solve the conjecture, you have to take that into account, right? Okay, so they will have to be unstable. And maybe, you know, somebody should try to prove this conjecture. I think none of us at this point, none of the people who are worked. Why do you think really, uh, <laughs> sorry? Yeah, I, I think they. Correct, yeah. So in other, in other words, the, the, the issue of stability should be measured in terms of the initial value problem. This, you see, the rigidity conjecture has nothing to do with the initial value problem in some sense, right? It, it's just a, a problem about all possible stationary states. And, uh, uh, but if I also connect it somehow to the initial conditions, and if I know that there is one uh, st stationary solutions which is which is uh, for, for which you have this t trapnel geodesics, I look at the corresponding data on a space-like hypersurface, and I make a small perturbation that would be unstable. Yeah, but I don't see why. It seems to me that you're simply emotionally attached to the first conjecture that you made, which is this maximal global. You, you want to save that one, but here you are, you are really... Well, give, give, yeah, okay, so give me a chance to respond. Yeah, give me a chance to respond next time, because you have to go through a little bit more. But, I believe it's unstable. Uh, of course, it, you know, if it's, un if it's stable, it's even better because it will be a more interesting, it will definitely lead to something in very interesting. But I, I, and of course, it, it will mean that the cosmic censorship conjecture is also wrong. No, sorry, not the cosmic censorship, but the, the final state will be wrong, right? Will be wrong. Yeah, okay, so anyway, let, let's leave it as, it as it is. It's an interesting issue, both from the point of view of proving the conjecture. I, I think that is probably, it's difficult, but probably not impossible, given the techniques we have today. And then the other thing uh, is to show that there are space times which are stationary with, and which have this uh, T-trap now geodesics. And then finally, to show that they are unstable, uh, which will, uh, I think will make Slava happy, right? You, you, you'd rather have it unstable. No? Yeah, well, it's hard for me to validate the evidence. Right. Okay. Anyway, let's go. Let's go to the issue of collapse because we, we don't have that much more time. So, uh, so collapse can block form starting from reasonably initial data configurations, uh, and this has to do with trap surfaces. Namely, uh, you cannot. It's not so easy to show that there are no black holes because the concept of a black hole is kind of a tautological concept that you can only understand once you have a global picture of the space-time, right? So uh, if you, in other words, you have to understand the, you know, whatever you do, it, you'll have to have a global theory in order to understand uh, formation of black holes. So that's complicated, but there is a concept which was introduced by Penrose, which, uh, uh, in, con in connection with this uh, incompleteness theorem, which uh, allows you to reduce the problem of formation black of black holes uh, if you assume the weak cosmic censorship conjecture, which of course is a huge conjecture, but if you assume it, then the problem reduces to the, uh, the connection to the fact that there exist, uh, exist trap surfaces, right? The existence of trap surfaces. And the notion of a trap surface, which I'm going to explain in a second, is a local notion. So it doesn't, you don't care about the global picture, right? So that's why it's very, it's very powerful. It's a concept introduced by Penrose. Uh, here is what it is. It's very simple. 
imagine a space-time and imagine a two-surface in the space-time, right? So if I am in if I am in Minkowski space and I have a two-surface, then uh, I can generate two types of null cones, right? So I can look at null geodesics perpendicular to the surface, moving in this direction, in other words, moving out, and the ones moving in, right? So you get light cones this way and, and that way. So if I look at the corresponding area, in other words, if I, if I change, if I move a little bit in this direction, the, uh, the surface S, and I look at uh, how the area changes, I see that the area, of course, is decreasing in this direction and increasing in this direction, right? right? So that's a typical situation in, in uh, <laughs> now, of course, you can have a more complicated situation where the two surface looks like this, which in, in that case, if you look at the corresponding light cones, you'll see that the, the ones here, the, the, in the region where the, the, the surface looks like this, then the areas will also decrease in this region, but they cannot, in other words, in the outgoing direction. So one is the outgoing direction, the other one incoming. So, so these areas can decrease locally in the outgoing direction, but globally, uh, you, you can never make something which is outgoing decreasing at all points. And this can be measured by something which are called expansions. So you, you can actually write down some geometric quantities, which are called trace chi and trace chi bar. I'll talk more about these quantities later on, but for the moment I'll just mention there are some very simple concepts, geometric concepts, uh, which measure exactly the change of areas in these directions or in the outgoing direction. So this is the incoming direction, this is the outgoing direction. So here, again, it's in the outgoing direction for trace chi, so this measure uh, and this measure trace sky bar. And if this is positive, at points where trace sky is positive, the area is, de is increasing. At points where trace sky is negative, it's decreasing. So here, trace sky will decrease in this, in this region, but will increase everywhere else. Uh, and uh, uh, now, with all this, a trapped surface is very simply is defined as being a surface. But if you look at the expansion, these geometric expansions, which can be defined in general, both geometric expansions are negative. So in other words, the area is decreasing in both directions, both in the incoming and the outgoing direction. Right? So this is obviously something that you cannot have in Minkowski space. Right? But you can have, in fact, in, if, you look at the, if you look at Schwarzschild, so if you look at the picture of Schwarzschild, if you look at the point, so points inside the black hole region are two surfaces, in fact. All those two surfaces are, uh, in fact, trapped, right? So you see that uh, in, in a black hole you have traps. On the other hand, if I'm outside, every surface outside is not trapped, right? So somehow the trapping has something to do with a, with a black hole, right? So it, it kind of, and in fact, you can show that if you have a trap, yeah, so th this is the singularity theorem. So le let me mention now the singularity theorem. So Penrose's Penrose, uh, theorem is the following. If you have, say, Ricci uh, in any null direction, Ricci is a two tensor, and I apply it to any, two, any null direction L. If Ricci is positive, in particular, if Ricci equal to zero, that's obviously true, right? So in, in flat case, this condition is trivial. Uh, if, in addition, M contains a non-compact or she hypersurface, this is typically our case because we talk about asymptotic flatness, so you have something, right, something which is non-compact, right, as you go to infinity. So this also is a very simple condition to generate. And uh, if it has a trapped surface now, so this is a, a hard condition, if it has a trapped surface, then it must have a, uh, a sing not a singularity, it must be incomplete. In other words, there will be, in that case, uh, null geodesics, which will have to terminate in finite time, in finite affine parameter time, right? So it doesn't tell you anything about the nature of the singularity. It doesn't tell you that the curvature blows up. It doesn't, it's a very, very weak statement, but it's, it's an incompleteness, we call it an incompleteness statement, uh, exactly for the reason that it only says something about the existence of some null geodesics which are incomplete, right? But it's nevertheless a remarkable theorem because using very little, you can prove something which is extremely interesting. So in particular, if you, travel, if you have a trapped surface and the cosmic censorship is true, then you must have a black hole, right? Because a cosmic censorship means you cannot have singularities outside black holes. But uh, if you have a trapped surface, uh, 
automatically have to mean that there is also a black hole because it has to be hidden under the black hole. So, so somehow trap surfaces detect black holes. All right, so now, uh, so the questions which are raised by the third. Yeah. Have you steering? Yes. Uh, so uh, if you, you want to, uh, to have a nice initial data, so. Yes. And you want to have a, a trap surface. What is this? It has to be big. Yeah, yeah, of course. You cannot be. Uh, it cannot be close to Minkowski space, right? You cannot have close to Minkowski space, right? But th this will be exactly what I'm going to talk about, right? Yeah. All right. So, uh, so these are the the questions. Uh, can trap surfaces form in evolution? In other words, starting with things which don't have trap surfaces. So I start with an initial data free of trap surfaces. I want to develop one in the future, right? This is sort of the analogous of saying that there are no black holes originally, but later in evolution you form a black hole, right? All right, so uh, can they form from non-isotropic initial condition? So this is very interesting because essentially all the intuition that, that people have, including the one of Penrose, is that you have to produce energy from all directions in order to form a trap surface, in order to have collapse, right? So for example, if you have a collapse of a, of a of a star, of a neutron star, to a black hole, it's a collapse in all directions, right? So somehow the, the intuition was, or the is, to many people, is that you have to pump energy from all directions in order to form a black hole, because the trap surface, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a, a condition, a large condition in all possible directions. All right, so that's, uh, Finally, what is the nature of the singularity predicted by Penrose? This is a, an open question. It's a fundamental open question, but very little is known. But I'm not going to talk about this. So, okay, so here is a result. So this is one of the results which was proved by Christodoulou uh, in 2008, right? Most of the results were proved in recent years, right? So the, the, all these developments, many of these developments happened in the last 20 years, let's say. So uh, Christodoulou showed uh, that there exists an open set of regular vacuum, right? So in other words, this is for the vacuum equations. By the way, again, a lot of the intuition that physicists have is that you have to have matter in order to produce a, a black hole, right? Here, uh, this is actually happen in, in vacuum, uh, you, you have in, in vacuum, in other words, you don't have any matter. Uh, so the, the, the formation of a trap surface has to do with, with gravitational waves, in fact. All right, so, uh, so this, is a, uh, this is a picture the initial data here are not taken on a space-like hypersurface, which is a little bit more complicated. Uh, to simplify, you take the initial data on two null hypersurfaces. So these are null. So this is a characteristic initial value problem in partial differential equations, which is very well understood also. So it's not more difficult than the initial value problem. In other words, I can, instead of taking data on a space-like hypersurface, I take data here and here, okay? On two null, so these are null hypersurfaces. So you can see it in, in this picture. There. There's this null hypersurface and this null hypersurface. So I, take, I want to take data here and here, right? Which corresponds to here and here. So uh, what he did was to take Minkowski data here, right? So these are, trap, these are trivial data. And on this side, in other words, on this side, you take, uh, you take what he calls a short pulse. So in other words, you, you, you take initial data which are give somehow a pulse in this direction, a strong pulse in this direction, right? Okay, and then he, he checked, of course, the following things, right? That uh, you can construct data which are sufficiently large, so the pulse has to be sufficiently large to form a trap surface. So it has to be sufficiently large, but free of trap surfaces here. So initially there are no trap surfaces. Of course there are no trap surfaces here because this is Minkowskian data. Right? And then he has to show this initial data, you have to solve the Einstein the full Einstein equations. By the way, in the case of Penrose, you don't have to solve the Einstein equations at all. I mean, the, the result of Penrose is based purely on the so-called Raichaduri equation, which is just one equation of many in the, in the, uh, the Einstein vacuum equation. So it's, it's actually a very, very soft result. The, the result of Penrose is very, very soft, but it's remarkable nevertheless. So here you have to solve the full Einstein equations and show that you have a solution sufficiently long time so that the trap surface can form. So this is a semi-local result. I mean, semi-global, sorry. 
It's a semi-global result. It's not a local result. It's not like it won't shock everyone. It's much, it's much, much more complicated. In fact, the proof is very much is quite similar to the proof of stability of Minkowski space about which I'll talk next time. Yes. So do, do you take in this configuration? Do you take advantage of the center of mass energy to, to show the existence of the final trapped surface? Because uh, there are similar setups in, in discussed in physics where you collide particles and then a big black hole forms. Which yeah, no, so this is, this is actually simpler than that in a sense, right? Because uh, that, one, that one has to do with two black holes. Uh, no, it's not. I mean, it's in, a, in a way, this is actually simpler. It, what's remarkable here is that you can do it in vacuum. You don't need anything else. Well, we should discuss. Uh, it doesn't it seems to me. Uh, yeah, I never understood this crystal. What was? It's the first time I'm starting to understand what the reaction should. Okay. All right. Well, so uh, please interrupt me. I mean, there is no reason to go fast. I, what I want to say is that again, you you could put the initial data here and here on two null hypersurfaces, right? Minkowski and here, so it's flat. You don't have to do anything interesting here. Uh, but you choose uh, a set of initial conditions here, which is sufficiently large so that you can prove a, a, a semi-global result. Semi-global means, for example, I have a parameter delta. I have a parameter delta, let's say. And the size is of, let's say, delta to the minus a half or something like that. So the size of the data here is delta to the minus a half. Right? Which means typically in the local existence, for people who know how to prove local existence, you will get a solution only up to delta to the one half in time. Right? So you can extend it only for a short time. Right? So here you have to extend it for a whole, for a whole uh, I mean up to one in other words. Right? So data is of size delta to the minus a half, but you solve it up to time one in this direction. Right? Okay, so this is a this is. Physicists, I mean, it's clear that you are taking advantage of center of mass because why do you throw things from two sides? If you just get a pulse coming from one direction, then by itself it would not form a, a trapped surface. So clearly you have to have two uh, two pulses which coming from two directions, one curved space in one direction. By itself, it would not be sufficient to fully on the other side start curving. So actually, the your intuition two, is, and then they kind of. They work Actually, together. Okay, so let, in some region where they come close to each other, so the two pulses propagate and they come close. But to you are talking about a pulse from here and one from here, right? One from left, one from right. Right, but here it's th th there is no pulse coming from here. There are no pulses. There are no pulses from here, right? So this is this is this is trivial data. So the only the only pulse is here, right? Ah, there's just one pulse. It's right? just one pulse, just on the left. One pulse on the left. That's all. Okay. Right. But I'll show you even more, OK? So th this is the first result. So just one pulse here. But, but the pulse is, is large in all directions, all angular directions, right? So you, you are still pushing things. You are producing a, a lot of gravitational energy in all, from all directions, right? OK, so that, that's important. So, uh, uh, so in other words, it's uniform along null. Uh, yeah, so, so anyway, so this is a general result. Right? But then in addition, in that class, by the way, this is a hard part of the proof. You, you, you have to show that, to show that you can control the, the solution for a long, long time is where you have to use a lot of analysis. Right? But once you have that, once you have produced a space time which you control, then there is a second part which, is that, which says that among all those solutions, all those initial class of initial data which I control by my existence result, I pick up uh, a, a special condition, an additional condition, which is, in fact, a, a condition of uniformity along di directions. Uh, then a uh, trap surface must form. And at the same time, you show that the, the, the data is such that you don't have a trap surface to start with. And you can make this quantitative, right, relative to this parameter delta. So the, the, this parameter delta is a parameter that measures the strength of the, of the, of the pulse. But why does it have to be uniform? I mean, isn't this enough to... I mean, in physics, is, there are such situations discussed where you just throw in stuff from two directions, it comes okay. close to each other, and you have a structure. So let me, let me show this, uh, this as a result, okay? That you might find more interesting. All right, so this is a result that I have with uh, Ron Jansky and on Luke, right? So, <laughs> right, so it's, uh, it's actually... Uh, what's interesting is that 
it's based uh, on the first part of Christodoulou's result. Well, Christodoulou's result was very long and it was simplified and we, you know, we have much better understanding. Instead of 600 pages as it was originally, it's now only about you know, 50 pages, let's say. This is one of the cases where long proofs have been simplified quite a lot. Uh, so anyway, but, but th that result is still used here, except now the difference is that I, I take a pulse which is concentrated only in one direction. And everywhere else, else I can make it to be Minkowskian, say, right? So in other words, it's the same situation is that except, except that instead of taking a pulse which is strong in all directions, I take a pulse which is now strong in only one direction. Of course, I have to take a, a sufficiently strong pulse. And I form a trap surface later on. Right? So the, the theorem is that it gives you conditions on, on, on the initial data here so that you form a trap surface later on. Now what's interesting is that this trap surface, you see, in the previous result, the, the trap surface, the proof of the result is based on what is called the Dublin null foliation. In other words, you foliate the space-time by a family of light cones going this way and, and light cones going this way. Okay? So that gives you a foliation which is represented here in this picture by these surfaces and these ones, right? So, and, and, and somehow this double non-foliation plays a very important role in the proof of the first result, right? That you, you have uh, this one here. Uh, so the, the actual trap surface is actually in this foliation. So you find the trap surface at the end of, the, of your space time here. So the trap surface would be right here. So this is a trap surface, right? Uh, in our result, that's not the case anymore. You have to find a deformation. So you see, you, you actually have to deform the two, so the, the, the surfaces of the foliation, of the double null foliations are this one, are these regular surfaces here. And you have to find actually by an argument, which is uh, uh, deformation argument, you have to find uh, this one, right? So this is the case when you, 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 you can show that actually all you have to do, you don't need two pulses, as you said, you need just one pulse in one direction and you already get a, uh, you can already get a trap surface. So if you have two, of course, uh, you would think that it's a little bit easier, but... but does it have to be a bit focusing as well? This one here. Well, obviously, you have to focus it in this direction. I mean, you have to produce a lot of energy in this direction. But of course, you, you don't have a trap surface originally. I mean, it's, as it is obvious, because the, you, you, everything is, is Minkowski and outside uh, that region, right? Yes? Does the trap surface as the maybe um, formalized as a kelp? Like? No, no, no. So this is trapped. Trap surface is not yet a black hole. It, it detects a black hole. So, you know, if you have a trap surface, you can say that, that the black form will form later. Once you have the trap surface, a black hole will form. But, uh, yes? Uh, how, how, how long did it take in time to, 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 for the formation of the trap surface? Yeah, so again, if you have a pulse of size, say, delta to the one half, delta, whatever. So if it's delta, as you know, existence will go... Sorry, delta to the minus one, excuse me. This is delta to the... I mean, sorry, the size of this is delta, and the strength of the pulse is delta to the minus a half. Delta to the minus a half, right? And then you, you, you can... This, this falls at time one. This time one, yeah. Right, yeah. So, uh, okay. So anyway, so this is formation of trap surface. Now, there are many other results of interesting, but I guess I'll have to stop. I, uh, I wanted also to talk about stability, which is maybe the main focus of, uh, of what I'll talk about here, uh, but I guess I'll leave it for next time. All right, so anyway, if there are any questions, I'll... Yes.